thought I could be what I wanted to be, and I thought I could build on life's sinking sand, but I can't even walk without a hope. I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Mountains so high and the valley so wide. Down on my knees. I've learned to stand I can't even walk Without you holding my hand I thought I could do Come on it all on my own I thought I could do it all day long come on Dick and I thought I would be a mighty good man but I can't even walk yeah. without you holding my hand well Lord I can't even walk without you holding my hand Well, 
Come on. Yeah. Come on now. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we often say, we can do the benediction right there. We can't do anything without Jesus Christ working in our lives thank God for the song this morning to remind us that God is indeed at work in the lives of uh, the believer. We can't walk without him holding our hands. But I love what the song said. Down on my knees is when I learned to stand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. We praise God this morning. God be the glory and all praises to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We can't walk, church, without God holding our hands. We thank God yet again for who he is in our lives, knowing that God is indeed in control. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3. We said it's going to take us three Sundays, and even after three Sundays, there's still much, much more. Paul to the church at Rome. He says here in chapter number 12 and verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Each of God the Father, we do embrace your presence yet again. We thank you, Lord God, for reminding us, Lord God, that we can't walk without you leading us. We pray now, Father, that the Spirit will continue to lead, guide, direct our minds, our thoughts, our hearts, our actions, Lord God, that you might be glorified. We pray, Father, that you would speak for your servant here. We pray now, Father God, that as we go into your word, that you might teach us, Lord God, something that we may not know. That you encourage us, Lord God, that we might do something that we've never done. But at the end of the day, Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for who you are. Realizing, Lord God, all things come of thee, and of thine own we give back unto you. For it's in your name, Christ Jesus, we do pray. Amen. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. The measure of faith, part three this morning. First John 5, 4. For whatsoever born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What I'm trying to say, the measure of faith this morning, as we've been looking at Romans chapter 12, we want to continue to walk by faith. But there are some requirements that you and I must do. We have come to know that the measure of faith requires us to be holy, humble, and honest. It has also been stated, Sister Belford, that the measure of faith requires you and I to be distinctive, diligent, and devoted. Uh, last time we shared the words of the prophet Micah. He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee. He says, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. We're talking about being holy, humble, and honest. But today we're reminded by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. 
Verse 2, Sister Colt says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But see, as a steward, as a manager of, how, of the household or the affairs belonging to someone else, don't you know that God has called you and I to be managers? Managers of that in which he has given us. Uh, we said that Paul had been telling the church at Rome. Uh, I heard in the song a few minutes ago, we cannot do anything without God holding our hands. Uh, so we said on that first series, the first sermon, we said that it's not about us doing anything. We cannot take any credit for doing anything. And Paul is telling us today that, that we are managers of the things of God. But it says a steward is a manager. The head of the house or the priority has entrusted the management of the affairs and the cares of somebody else's hands. Don't you know that God has placed some things in our hands that we might do all that God has created and called us to do? Those of you on the call this morning, we, we, the, the Bible is teaching you and I that, that we are stewards. A, a steward is an overseer. It's a teacher, a superintendent, someone who manages the affairs of the affairs of someone else. The last time I checked, everything Deacon Manley belonged to God. But God has given you and I a charge to manage those things in which he has given us. It says stewards, back in the day, they were treasurers of the city's finances. I said all that to say that the Bible is teaching you and I, as we continue to, to look at what God is doing in our lives, there's a question that I have this morning. Are we fulfilling the call in which God has called us? See, God requires some things of you and I. Are we fulfilling God's call, the requirements? Do, do we believe, do we trust in God's word? See, Paul he said that God has made provision for us. Uh, it says here in verse 3 that God has dealt. God has given you and I everything that we need in order to pull this thing off. Uh, I love what Peter says in his letter. He says that God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything that we need that, that, that to, to pull off that in which God desires of us. All we have to do is allow the Holy Spirit to work those things out in our lives. But see, it's all about us being distinctive. It's all about us being devoted to the things of God. Understanding that God has required you and I to do some things. But see, if we really look at this lesson, we find that there is some division throughout this world. Uh, see, 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 Paul, I told you last week that we all needed one another. If we look at the Senate, we look at the Congress, if we look at the schools, if we look at the police department, if we look out throughout this world, we'll find that there's division everywhere. And see, Paul, he was writing to the church at, 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 at Rome. He, he spent those first 11 chapters giving us doctrine, and, and now he's telling us that ought not be any division in the church. Oh, see, that's what Paul told that church at Corinth. He said, there ought not be any division, there ought not be any schism within the body. And so Paul, he stopped by to tell us that if we're going to be devoted to the things of God, if we're going to be distinctive, if we're going to be holy, humble, and honest, well, first of all, we didn't do it of our own intuition, but Paul says that, that we need to what? We need to love one another. There ought not be any division in the house of God. But see, are you trusting God with your gifts, your talents, and your abilities? See, it's, it's the spirit and the power of God that brings us together. And see, there are some requirements that the Bible is teaching you and I as we walk by faith. We got the trust in God that God might bring us together that his will might be done. We said last week there was one body but many members. 
Not everybody having the same office. See, I can't sing like the deacon just finished singing. I can't play like Brother Manley and Sister Williams just finished playing. I, 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 I can't do everything that you're doing. And, and guess what? But God has equipped the body to do all that's required that his will might be done. But he's telling us that we ought to be what? We ought to be receiving one another. He says, we being many are one body in Christ. But he does not want us to miss Brother Williams and everyone members of one another. But see, we have to understand that Paul is directing the church at Rome. He's directing you and I that even though we live in a world that is called, that, that seems like it's separated, but don't you know there's no separation in God? See, 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 God is at work in your life. He's in work in my life. He's in work on your life. The ones on the call this morning. And what Paul is saying that since we are members of one another, verse 17 in, in Romans 12, it says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Oh, see, the problem is that we're all trying to get back at one another. We can't get in the laws passed because they, you know, you know, since I got the majority and since I, you know, you know, what I'm trying to say is and what Paul is saying is that if we, you know, God has required that you and I might be stewards of his household, that his will might be accomplished. We said last week, we've been saying for the last eight years, there's no big ass and little use here at New Union. And the Bible is teaching you and I, he says that recompense it, it, in our lesson, it refers to paying somebody back. Uh, when I was growing up, Sister Dunnett, Trustee Dunnett, when I was growing up, uh, the word on the street, Sister Belford, uh, Sister Manley, it was that, don't get mad, get even. Uh, see, that's the, that's the era that I grew up. I, I don't know what the word was on the street when, when you were growing up. In, in other words, if somebody did something to you, you wanted to get back at them. But it says here that a recompense to no man evil for evil. He says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. See, God is calling you and I that we might what? Oh, you know, trust in him first of all, that we might walk in faith, believing that God has placed all of us together, that we ought not be coming up against one another, but be managers or good stewards of that in which God has entrusted to us. But see, that's the Bible this morning. We ought not be trying to do something wrong to someone because they did something to us. Uh, see, that's the problem. That's the issue. And Paul said that it ought not be in the church. But I'm reminded that, you know, there's too much, you know, you know, well, church in the world. But I mean, too much world in the church and not enough church in the world. And what the Bible is saying is, is that you and I have to come to an understanding that God has called us to work together that his will might be done. Uh, well, see, that's what Paul says. Don't try to get even. Allow God to work out those things in the lives of the believer, of those who are coming up against us. But he says here, the word repents, recompense rather. He, he don't want us to give what's due to somebody else. See, God knows exactly who is guilty. God knows exactly who deserves punishment. He's not leaving it up to you and I because in verse 10, 19, he says, dearly beloved. He says, avenge not yourselves. But look what he says. He said, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. See, avenge means to vindicate. It means to do justice. It, it means to protect. It means to defend one person from another. See, we don't have to stand up for ourselves because Jesus Christ is standing up for us. We don't have to stand up against anybody because Jesus Christ is working in your life as well. He is working in my life. And the Bible is saying revenge is the punishing of someone. And don't you know that God is the only one that's qualified to punish somebody? 
He's the only one that I know, Jesus Christ. He's the only righteous one that I know. And the Bible is saying here is that if God desires to, do, to correct someone, allow God to do it. See, Paul, he understood that if we're going to walk by faith, if the measure of faith in our lives, we have to understand that we need to depend on one another. Y'all got quiet on me. I told you last week, I need you. You need me. We all are part of God's family. And that's what Paul is telling us this morning, that the measure of faith requires you and I to do something. Uh, that's what it's saying. We, we said all week, uh, the last three weeks, we, we've been saying that this measure of faith, God, God is requiring you and I to do something that our lives might be in better, that our lives might continue to be all that God is calling you and I to do. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is, as we get ready to celebrate tomorrow, we, we get ready to celebrate Memorial Day, don't worry about who has come up against you. Don't worry about those who are, are trying to do something to you. Just remember the Bible is saying that we all need one another. Paul says that I can't sing like you sing. I, I can't teach like you teach. I, what I'm trying to say is God has gifted you. He's gifted me. He's given you. You're in the Bible is telling us that we have to what? We have to do all that God is requiring of us. And the first thing that he wants us to understand is we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, he taught his disciples. He trained them. He walked with them. He, he showed them. He empowered them. And guess what? God is doing the same for you and I. And what Paul is saying is don't trust in your own abilities. Don't trust in your own know-how. Allow the power of God to work in our lives because if he says we're going to get to the other side trusting and depending on God, we are going to get to the other side. You notice it? I didn't say I'm going to get to the other side. I didn't say you're going to get to the other side. I said we, us, we are going to get to the other side because faith tells us that, our, uh, that, that, that the God in whom we serve, he has, what? he has called each of us to be a manager. Uh, not to rule over one another, but to work with one another in managing the affairs, the gift, talents, and the abilities that he's given us. But as I go to my seat this morning, the measure of faith. We often say that God didn't give us an inch, a yard, or a mile. I told you on that, on that first uh, sound of sermon, considering the measure of our faith, if only that you have is a teaspoon, if God is only a teaspoon, that might be all that you need. But I'm telling you that if you exercise the faith in which God has given you, there is what he said that he has given you the measure. He didn't say that it was, he didn't say that it was a teaspoon. He didn't say that it was a tablespoon. He says all we have to do is walk in faith. But do you know what the requirement is? A requirement is something that God has, in, you know, has directed or is, or is directing us to do. But as I take my seat this morning, the measure of faith requires consistency. Uh, do you pray with consistency? Do you study the word of God each and every day? Are you walking by faith because of the things in which you see? But don't you know we said that faith is, what, is, is being able to see that in which we don't see that God might continue to work in our lives. But consistent, it refers to agreeing. It refers to conforming. It, 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 it talks about constantly adhering to the same principles of a course of action. In other words, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, see, you and I ought not to be changing. You know, I, 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 when I was growing up, there was a song that said, any way the wind blows, it was cool with me. I know y'all never heard that song. But consistency, it means to be compatible, not, not self-contradictory, but upholding firmly together for a particular cause. See, God has called you and I that we might lift up the name of Jesus where it's pleasing in the Father's sight. 
The Bible says there's coming a day when every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. And God is calling you and I that we might do it together right now. And then, of course, when we go and appear before him, we got to do it on our own. But see, consistency is a firm but fixed, steady, and harmonious form of continued growth. In other words, as we're walking by faith. See, I know that God is able, as I looked that corner on yesterday, my faith in God is stronger today than it was on yesterday. When I look out into the audience, when I, you know, talking to those who might be on the call, see, if we continue to look to God, we'll see that God is working in our lives, even though some folk don't realize that God is still at work. See, see, God is what God is doing everything that he's always, always done. He's been working in your life, working in my life, working in the life of those who have yet to accept him. But if we're going to look at some consistency, the first thing that Paul tells us in verse 11, he says, not slothful in business. See, God has called you and I to do something. I told you last week I can't open the Bible on Saturday night and stand before God and his people on Sunday morning. I, I just can't do it. it. It says don't be, you do you do you know what slope for is? Yeah, yeah, if you don't know what slope for is, read over there in the book of Proverbs. It says that, you know, there's an individual, you know, he's so, you know, he's so lazy to he what he don't even want to put the food up to his mouth to eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's in there, it's in there. But what I'm trying to say is, he says, not be slothful in business. See, God has called you and I to do a task. If we trust God, exercising the faith in which he has given us, we would understand that Paul says that without what? Without God working in our life, we can do nothing. That's what he says here in, in verse number three. He said that we ought, what, we ought not look highly, you know, you know to, uh, 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 at ourselves than we ought to, but we ought to be trusting God. But he says not slothful in business, but he says fervent in spirit. And see, it's all about God this morning. It's all about understanding that God is indeed at work, that our trust, our hope, and our desire is in God. He says serving the Lord. See, see, when we're on one accord, when we're coming in to do what God has called us to do, whether it's cutting grass, whether it's washing dishes, whether it's talking, you know, taking out the trash, what I'm trying to say is, Paul is saying here, is that God has created you and I to do a work. He called us to be stewards, and the Bible is teaching you and I that a steward is what? He, he is considered, you know, a, one that God has given to what? To manage his affairs, his affairs, and he says that we ought to be faithful. But see, not only he says that we need to be fervent in spirit serving the Lord, verse 12 says rejoicing in hope. See, are you rejoicing about what you know God is capable of doing? See, that's the good news this morning. I can rejoice knowing that God is at work in the lives of his people. I can rejoice this morning in hearing the testimonies of how God has brought someone out. See, I can rejoice this morning knowing that God is at work in your life. I, I can rejoice with you as, as God continues to work those things out for your good. But it says here that we need to be patient in tribulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's the problem. Yeah, we, we, we said during the revival that, that people want to go through the quarter mile, but the, the Bible is teaching you and I every now and then we got to go down to Daytona. We got to go down to Talladega. We got to go to the Indianapolis 500. What I'm trying to say is the Bible is teaching you and I that God wants us to be managers of our, of our attitude. He, he wants us to understand that if we just trust in him, God is going to get us to the other side. Rejoicing in hope. He says patient in tribulation, but he says continuing instant in prayer. See, God knows all about your situation. He knows all about my situation. Those on the call, he knows all about your situation. And the Bible is saying that God requires consistency in our lives. He wants us to what? He don't want us to be, you know, as, as, as Peter said, you know, busy in other men's matters. He 
want us to be busy in the things of God. God will get us to do, you know, he will empower us to do all that he required for us to do. But we ought to be rejoicing and knowing that God will indeed answer our prayer. You know, God has already answered. All we have to do is be patient in the tribulation. And then we need to be constant in prayer. It's not that God don't know. It's not that God don't understand. But when it comes to prayer for me, I'm just remind, you know, I'm just continuing to let God know that I trust him. See, see, if I didn't trust him, I wouldn't call on him. If I didn't trust him, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't pray. And what I'm trying to say is any way that the wind blows and it pertains to God is cool with me. He says rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. In other words, whatever you're going through, you can rejoice because God is indeed at work. All we have to do is continue to put our confidence in him by telling him how much we trust him, how much we love him, knowing that God is going to work a work in our lives because he, yet again, he's the same yesterday, today and forever. See, the measure of faith not only requires for us to be consistent. The Bible is teaching you and I this morning that the measure of faith requires compassion. See, see, that's the problem. That's the issue. See, I don't love nobody but myself. See, see that's the problem. That's that's the issue, but the Bible is teaching you and I that we have to have love one for the other. That's what Jesus said. He was teaching his disciples. He said that you will know, men will know that you are my disciples by, by the way that you have love one for the other. See, see, that's what Paul is saying that if we're going to exercise the gifts in which God has given us, we have to have compassion. See, compassion is a feeling of sympathy, of sympathy rather, or pity for others especially one that makes you want to help them. In other words, what Paul is saying is, is that we ought to love not only the God in whom uh, we serve, we got to love those in whom that are serving with us. See, compassion is sometimes used interchangeably with sympathy, but, but the most common meaning is, is the sharing of emotions with someone else, especially during time of sadness. In other words, we ought to be encouraging one another when they're going through. See, you might not be going through anything today, but just keep on living. The Bible is teaching you and I that one day it's going to come down our street. And, and, while we are, and while we are rejoicing and hope being patient in tribulation, we ought to be working and praying constantly to God, not only for ourselves, but our brothers and sisters in Christ. But see, the Bible is teaching you and I that both words are used in context of feeling sorry for those who are experiencing some type of adversity. But don't you know that the Bible the Bible teaches you and I that we're going to go through some things. Yeah, that, that's what it's teaching us. See, that, that's what calls us to depend on God. If we're going to walk this thing out called faith, we got to trust in a living God. But in our lesson, compassion is understood as a feeling that motivates individuals to help others. See, you ought to be motivated to help your brother and your sister in Christ. He said that we help them by exemplifying and expressing love. See, that's what the Bible is teaching you and I this morning, that the, the, the God in whom we serve is a God of love, and he desires that you and I might do the same. See, this feeling often includes the desire desire to alleviate or share the pain. Have when the last time you shared the pain of somebody else? Uh, uh, you might not be physically pain, but, but your spirit ought to be what well, it ought to be at a state to whereas you can identify with what that person might be going through. But the Bible is saying here, not only pain, but distress. Have when the last time you saw somebody stressed out and you came to the aid? Those who are suffering from some type of unfortunate situation. But look what Paul says here as we look at this thing called compassion. He tells us here in verse number 13, he says distributing to the necessity of the saints. In other words, every now and then all you need is a comforting word. That's all we need. The Bible is teaching you and I that we step out on faith, believing and trusting, taking God at his word, that we might be able to comfort somebody in the word of God. He 
He said, distribute in the necessity of the saints and give in to hospitality. When the last time you showed kindness to someone else? See, see, that's what the Bible is saying is that if we are exercising the faith in which God has given us, we'll come out of what? We'll come out of our own uh, 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 selves and, and help somebody else. But he says here, now I told you earlier that he don't want us to get even. Look what he says here in verse number 14. He says, bless them which persecute you. See, that's what Jesus told his disciples. You remember when Jesus was, was teaching his disciples? He says, you know, he, he, he gave the analogy that, you know, they, they, they persecuted the prophets, you know. You know, they talked about me. And, and what he's trying to tell us is that we're in good company. If they came up against Jesus Christ, they came up against the prophets, you and I are no different. The Bible is saying here that we ought to be what? We ought to be blessing, you know, thanking God for those who come up against us because the more they come up against us, the closer we ought to get to God. That, that's what he's trying to tell us. If we're going to live this thing out called faith, he says, bless and curse not. See, you don't have to get even. You don't have to come up against them. Just allow the Spirit of God to work those things out in our lives. But as he's talking about this compassion, see, see, look what he says here in verse number 15. He says, rejoice with them that are rejoicing. He says, weep with them that are weeping. In other words, what the Bible is saying to you and I on today, having the the measure of faith is understanding that God has entrusted you and I that we might work together that, that we might lean on one another that, that we might depend on him as we depend on one another I love what he says if you're rejoicing I'm going to rejoice with you but that's the problem that's the issue many folk don't rejoice when God does something good in your life but that's what Paul is saying that we need to we need to have compassion one for the other he says if they cry if they weeping we whip them that's what the Bible is saying because the Bible tells us Paul told that church at Galatia he says bear ye one another's burdens yeah yes he did he said that you might be going through something I might not be feeling it the way that you're feeling it but he said that you know if I'm really you know true to myself I'm going what I'm going to walk with you knowing that my day might be coming oh yes it is but the Bible says here in verse number 16 he says be of the same mind one toward another. See, in other words, if you love yourself, you ought to love your fellow man. If you don't love your fellow man, you really don't love yourself. He says, be of the same mind one toward another. He says, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. See, in other words, God is teaching you and I to exercise the measure of faith. We cannot take no credit for anything. It is God God who is at work in our lives to will and to do of his good pleasure. But he says here as I take my seat in verse 20, he says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, he said, feed him. Now, when the last time you fed an enemy, when your enemies show up, you go the other way. If he thirsts, he said, give him drink. He said, in doing so, thou shalt he coals of fire upon his head. In other words, the Bible is teaching you and I, we ought to be kind to one another, even though if, if they treat you bad God is what God is going to take care of it because he says vengeance is mine that, that's what he said but, but having the measure of faith the God is requiring you and I that we might be consistent he requires that you and I might be compassionate but as I go to my seat for the last time the measure of faith requires commitment yeah, yes it does see commitment refers to assuring binding or obligating oneself to a particular cause do you know why God created you? See, God created us that we might worship him. He created that we us that we might fellowship with him. But the Bible is teaching you and I that we must have we a fellowship with one another that we might fellowship with God. Commitment is more than vowing. In other words, it's more than talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a song, you know, talking loud and, and saying nothing. But, but it says that putting our hands to the gospel plow and performing all that the Lord requires. God requires that you and I might be committed. Commitment refers to devoting or engaging oneself by going beyond personal biases and boundaries. So you got to come out of yourself in order to please God. 
That's what the Bible is saying this morning. To exercise the measure of faith, I got to what? I got to come out of myself, commit myself to him by committing myself to you. That's what he says here. But he says here, not only that we're moving beyond our personal biases and boundaries, we need to show love and respect to somebody else. Commit means to give and trust or charge. See, God has entrusted you. He's entrusted me. He's entrusted you. He's called us that, that we might take charge and do all that he has called us to do. He says that the Bible here, it tells us in verse 18, he says that this is the commitment that we ought to have to God. He said, if it be possible, as much as lie in you, he said, live peacefully with all men. See, God is required that you and I to be at peace. If we're not at peace with one another, we're not at peace with God. Because the Bible is saying that the measure of faith requires us to understand that it is God who is at work and not we ourselves. But I love what he says in verse number 21 as I take my seat. This is the last time. He says, be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. That's what the Bible, I start by today to say that if we're going to exercise the measure of faith, we have to understand that God has some requirements for you and I, and all he wants us to do is to do it together because if we're not doing it together, we're not doing it according to the will, the way, or the word of God. And he said this measure of faith, God requires some things. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be holy. He wants to be honest. And today he tells us that we need to be consistent. We need to be compassionate. And then, of course, we need to be committed. That's what God is telling each and every one of us on today. God is working. He wants us to be diligent and devoted and distinctive about the things in which he has called us to do. The measure of faith. We see that God has some requirements for you and I. And Paul, he wrote started with this 12th chapter. The things that he had taught me, he says now it's time to put it into action. We have to have love one for the other. Don't you know that God is love? Don't you know that the spirit, one of the attributes, one of the fruit of the spirit is love? We have access to the love of God by allowing him to work in our lives, believing that God has indeed given us the measure of faith. So be consistent, be compassionate, but more so be committed to the things of God. There might be someone today that want to walk with God. The Bible teaches you and I as we extend the invitation to discipleship. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because Jesus Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. You can, excite, you can exercise the measure of faith. The Bible says if you had the size of a grain of mustard seed. The Bible says if you believe in Jesus Christ, being the Son of God, giving his life that you and I might have. The Bible is teaching us, excuse me, that if we confess with our minds, believe within our heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he died, raised from the dead, now shall be saved. Contact us at newunionbc.org. We'll walk with you. We'll talk to you about the requirements in which God has placed on each of us that we might fulfill his will for our lives. The measure of faith. Keep walking, keep witnessing, keep worshiping the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible is teaching you and I on this road called life that we need to exercise the faith. We're walking by faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus.